Good afternoon, Trojans. I'm Erica Maldonado Singh, Senior Associate Director of USC Dornsife Alumni Relations. Thank you for joining us for today's Dornsife Dialogue. If you're watching on Zoom, you're welcome to submit a question at any time using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you have to leave today's discussion at any point or want to watch or listen to again, uh, it will be on our Dornsife Dialogues podcast, available on all your favorite podcast platforms. And the link to the video will be on the Dornsife Dialogues section of our website. Make sure to follow USC Dornsife on all social channels. Our handle is at USC Dornsife. Now I'll turn it over to the Dean of the USC Dornsife College of Letters, Arts and Sciences, Amber Miller. 
Welcome back to Dornsife Dialogues. This is the first episode of a new year, a time when so many of us have taken stock of what we can do to improve our health and well-being, made ambitious New Year's resolutions, and by now forgotten all about them. But in the spirit of pretending that they are still front and center, it's interesting to note that according to the American Psychiatric Association, about a third of health resolutions this year include taking a break from social media. This tracks because experts are increasingly finding that while engaging with social media in moderation might offer some benefits, maintaining a healthy balance has become increasingly difficult. And this is raising serious mental health concerns. What started as a mode of connection seems to be turning into a source of isolation and stress, especially for young people. Today, we'll hear from our expert panel about the growing challenges related to habitual social media use, and they'll share some of the steps that people can take to keep social media from taking over our lives. Our discussion will be moderated today by cognitive neuroscientist Jonas Kaplan, Associate Professor of Research at USC's Brain and Creativity Institute, and co-director of the Dornsife Cognitive Neuroimaging Center. Professor Kaplan's work explores issues relating to consciousness, identity, empathy, and social relationships. So let's get to it. I'll hand things over to Professor Kaplan, who will introduce our panelists. Thank you for joining us, and happy 2024. All right. Thank you, Dean Miller, and thank you, everyone, for being here with us today at Digital Detox. I'm going to introduce our speakers first, and we will start with Dr. Julie Albright. She is a digital sociologist, and uh, she specializes in digital culture and communications, teaches master's level courses on the psychology of interactive technologies and sustainable infrastructure at USC Dornsife and Viterbi. And her research is focused on the growing intersection of technology and behavioral systems. Her book, Left to Their Own Devices, How Digital Natives Are Reshaping the American Dream, explores the many ways digital natives' interactions with technology has changed their relationship with people, places, and jobs. And actually a film uh, based on this book is going to be coming out later this year called The Cost of Convenience. So uh, Julie, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. We also have today Dr. Ian Anderson. Ian is a recent graduate of uh, Dornsife Psychology Program, got his PhD here, and is now a uh, incoming postdoctoral scholar in computational neuroscience and the psychology of social media use at Caltech. His current research is focused on how anxiety and fear impact our interactions with social technology. His published research focuses on how the design of social media platforms impacts user behavior with respect to users' habits of posting and scrolling, spread of misinformation, and political extremism. Hello, Ian. Hi, Jonas. Thanks for having me. So thank you guys. Yeah, no, thanks for, for being here with us today to discuss this important topic that I think is just on everybody's minds nowadays. And we are actually going to start things out with a, with a poll from our audience. We, we're going to ask this question. We'd, we'd like everybody to respond. The poll question for you all is, how many hours a day do you spend on your phone? <clears throat> so just to give us a little bit of context uh, to, to see how much we're all spending on our phones. And I'm going to kick the, the conversation off with, with this question to Ian, which is, how actually do social media algorithms contribute to shaping our communication patterns and, and the way that we consume information? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so my research shows in general that social media platforms have done their best. They've got a lot of very smart researchers there who have done their best to optimize um, the structure of the platforms to capture as much of our time and attention as possible, because that's directly tied to their revenue streams, which is um, based on how many advertisements that they can place in your feed and how many users click on those advertisements and all sorts of things down there. So I'll highlight two kind of downstream effects of an attention an incentive structure um, that comes from this type of design. Uh, the first thing is that people form very strong habits to use these platforms, and that is by design. Um, and the second is that often the most uh, controversial content actually tends to rise to the top of the feeds um, because it's entirely based on engagement uh, and how much attention that content can get. 
um, not really necessarily what is best for their users' well-being or potentially best for society at large. Julie, is that how you see it as well? I do. Uh, you know, one of the things I look at, I'm a digital sociologist and also have a couple of counseling degrees. Uh, so I look at the intersection of behavior and technology. I've looked at it as kind of like a double helix where technology is now shaping behavior and behavior is shaping technology. Uh, and, you know, I, I just think in terms of what's going on, I'd, I'd like to zoom out and just set a context for it, which is we now have a generation growing up as digital natives. What that means is that they're growing up in a world where there always was an immigrant, uh, there always was an internet, as opposed to digital immigrants, which are those that are coming to the internet later. Uh, and so right now, what drove me to write my book and, and be interested in some of this uh, thinking about social media impacting us is I'm on the front lines as a professor at USC seeing the kids uh, struggling with some of the mental health issues and things of that nature. And, you know, there's, there's this, again, the behavior and technology of the technology side, but there's also impacts that are happening. We have a loneliness epidemic on our hands. 60% uh, of men now under 30 are single. 69% of high school kids have never had a relationship. Uh, we have anxiety, depression at the highest rates in 30 years in the universities. So this is what I call, and part of this is coming unhooked from relationships, coming unhooked from community organizations, coming unhooked from church and other sorts of community stabilizing structures where now we have this hyper attachment because of the algorithms and because of this sort of uh, addictive nature of it that sucks you in, as Ian was discussing, where I call this whole constellation of behaviors coming untethered. And we have an untethered generation, which creates this sort of mental and physical instability that's happening now. You know, I think that uh, the results coming in from our poll underscore what, what you've been saying here. The majority of our group has said they spend about three to four hours a day on their phones, which is a considerable amount of time, right? It's like we, we don't really sleep much more than that. So this is a big chunk of our lives now. I'm interested in what you both think about what we can do about this. I mean, how can we manage our stress on social media? Um, are there effective strategies for regulating one's, uh, one's, one's stress and be, being more mindful when we're on social media? Julie? Ah, I was, I was waiting for Ian to jump in there. <laughs> uh, well, <sorry. laughs> you know, it's gotten, it's gotten more and more challenging, uh, as we've said, and you can, th when, let me back up and say, when I first started studying this stuff, we had computers plugged into a wall. If you would use AOL or some other platform, you would use it, check your email, check a chat maybe, and then walk away from it. And that was it. Mobility or internet connected devices like the smartphone changed the game because that internet then went with you in your back pocket, in your purse, in your hand, on the table, uh, all the time. Uh, and as you mentioned, sleep, we have a global sleep deprivation crisis. Teens now say they're online, quote, almost constantly. They're checking their phone up to 30 or more times a night after going to bed. So this is what's happening. And what's gone on is it's, as Ian mentioned earlier, there are some very smart researchers where they baked in sort of addictive qualities that keep you coming back to, for more. As again, when I first started looking at this with a plug-in computer on a desktop, it didn't have that same quality. But now there are things that are very powerful behavioral drivers. For example, the scroll. Uh, it's very similar to a slot machine. We know gambling is addictive, right? You wanna just keep coming back because sometimes you pull that lever, you push that button, ding, 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 and you win, uh, yay. Then you try it again, and then you don't win. You don't win. Then you win, and yay, and you just keep on going. And that's called random reinforcement, and it's the most powerful behavioral driver we know to keep you coming back for more. And that's what's baked into Instagram. It's what's baked into TikTok. You just keep on seeing, ah, oh, boring content. Mm, that's okay. Wow. You know, that's exactly the same mechanism that's going on with gambling. So 
you know, my point is it's getting harder and harder to pull yourself away. Even myself who knows these things, you just get second, one more video, one more thing to see. So it's very challenging for the average person, especially kids who are now socializing in this world to pull yourself away. Ian, give us some hope. Is, is there anything we can do about this? Yeah, so um, my research has shown that there are some potential uh, areas for hope here. Um, although we do, I would definitely agree that uh, the way that the reward structure works, particularly with scrolling, um, combined with the omnipresence of um, social media, the notifications that come directly onto your main phone screen, all of those things form pathways that are easy to repeat over and over again. Um, and once you repeat that enough, it becomes something that you do pretty much automatically uh, or mindlessly as soon as you see those notifications come in. Um, I'm sure a lot of you will probably recognize the feeling of suddenly ending up on your favorite social media app, even though you were supposed to be checking Google Maps or something like this, right? Um, <laughs> like those, that, and that's, that's called a habit slip um, in, in, my, in my field of research. And that shows that um, you probably have a pretty strong habit to use those apps, which means that the interventions that you use are also going to need to be based on habit science, right? So if you find yourself, for example, constantly bringing your phone into bed with you, uh, constantly bringing your phone to the restroom, like all these kind of things that I think are very common. Um, the best things that you can do is to create so much friction that you disrupt that automatic habitual um, and potentially addictive level process that has been going on. Um, the, those are called basically cue based interventions, right? Where you'd literally have to physically put your phone like in a different room, uh, put it, uh, do things to the notifications, bundle them, um, put them on silent, hide the social media apps in places on your phone where they aren't usually. Um, although even those sometimes aren't extreme enough, you know, um, sometimes lock boxes with timers on them uh, or things like that to actually physically remove the phone from your site uh, and maybe even still use it as a sleep, sleep alarm to wake up in the morning. Uh, <laughs> those kind of things um, are probably the most helpful once you have a strong habit. Um, and doing those sort of disruptive behaviors can start to put you back on the path to having a more um, value and goal-oriented relationship with social media sites. Um, although it is very hard, it's, it's not easy for users. Julie, you'd like to add something to that? Yeah, uh, I just want to say that was a great description there. And uh, those are some of the things you don't want to do. You don't want to look at the al alerts. You don't want to see social media apps and things like that. I'd like to talk about some things you do want to do, uh, which is part of that coming untethered thing. Our largest, longest standing sociological studies show that being woven into the social fabric bolsters physical and mental health. Uh, for example, those that are lonely have a much higher rate of things like heart disease, things like strokes and other health issues. In fact, last year, the Surgeon General called for our attention to this loneliness epidemic we're talking about. So in addition to locking your phone away in another room, I would suggest that we need to reconnect with ourselves and our bodies, with our others in relationship and with nature and the sublime. Uh, for example, Let's set some sacred spaces aside at lunch or dinner with family or friends. The research shows that if you even have the phone on the table, it's like, it's like a drug. You're, you know, part of your attention is on that phone, and you're not really paying attention to those around you. Be present for your friends, your family, your partners. Look at them. Listen to them. That's, there's nothing better that you can do than to let someone else be heard. Uh, and spending time with your kids, uh, you know, and, and listening to them and talking to them. For example, having a family dinner together without devices. Spend more time physically, uh, walking, exercise. These kinds of things can be more effective than even pills for lifting depressions and things of that nature. And, and thirdly, spend more time in nature and the sublime where you're out and, and the calming aspects of nature and the things that are larger than you, the firmament of stars or the sea or the mountains, 
help to calm and put your life and your problems in more of a perspective and, uh, and, and really uh, helps to calm you down. So those are just a few things I would suggest. So I noticed that there's a little bit of an irony here that we're having this conversation online. Um, it, does, does this kind of connection that we're having now in, in being able to bring everybody together to, to listen to you guys, does that not, not uh, help in, for, for things like loneliness? Is this kind of social interaction not as powerful as, as real social interaction? So it, it depends, I think. Um, so there is some pretty good research showing that some types of online engagement when you are actively, you know, interacting with another person, sharing things with them. Um, and at the same time, as, as Julie said, not ignoring um, the important things in real life. Um, and if you're getting something valuable out of listening to the, uh, you know, a conversation like this or getting some, which I hope our audiences um, and, you know, or engaging with a friend or something like that. Like those things can actually be uh, decent for your well-being. I don't know if they are necessarily uh, comparable to a real world in-person interaction with that individual, right? But um, they are not at least a net loss um, per se. So I think there is some some hope there. Yeah, and I would remind all of us, we're embodied creatures. And the, the body and tactility and physicality largely gets erased online. And, you know, it, it's sort of like lowered cues and lowered connection. There's nothing like that face-to-face -face moment. I speak to a lot of executives in our country about this, and they're trying to figure out how to navigate this, you know, COVID, post-COVID, do we come back in the office, what, what do we do? And having that team building, having that face-to-face, -face, being together builds trust, builds relationships. And it's very challenging to do that over a Zoom. So really, I would say the key here is to be mindful of our use of technology. We, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to be Amish. I'm the last person that's going to say, hey, let's get out a buggy and throw our phone away. That's not my goal at all. But I think that, you know, we've raced out like racehorses out of the box with that iPhone and the excitement of connecting online and all these people and things and novel experiences and moments that we see on the Internet. But at this point, we can step back. It's been enough time and say, OK, is this healthy? And I would suggest just common sense for our audience today to say to yourself, why would we have this crisis of mental health and anxiety and loneliness? If face-to-face -face interactions were taking the place of, uh, you know, uh, if online interactions were taking the place of face-to-face, -face, you know, just commonsensically, that doesn't make any sense. So I would just say that remember that those things are still important. Our embodied lives are important. Our face-to-face -face, uh, interactions are important. We're social species. And for some reason, paradoxically, we're more connected than ever before, and yet we're less connected than ever before. Do we know very much yet about what the long-term effects of, of, of prolonged social media usage is over, over a long period of time, or is it sort of too early for us to know this yet? So in terms of the actual empirical research data, there is some research already coming out, um, some of it just now, because we're, we're only hitting about 20 years of Facebook, uh, I think a few weeks ago, something like that, um, uh, for example. But there are there is some long-term research that has shown at least uh, effects that are related to like symptoms of depression, uh, these other kinds of things. Um, but at the same time, um, a lot of the research that's done on these platforms is done internally to these social media companies. Um, they probably have a lot more information than any academic researchers or public researchers do. Um, and I think we saw that when a lot of the um, studies that had been done were leaked, um, showing in a lot of cases that Facebook and Instagram know that their websites are harming teenage girls, for example, um, in terms of their well-being, anxiety, um, and exacerbate 
existing problems uh, such as eating disorders and also can have negative effects on like other minority groups, even if a lot of the population level data shows either very small negative or even even sometimes very small positive effects or just total washouts. So some of the evidence is a little bit inconclusive, but I think um, if the social platforms were to open up their data to academics and outside researchers to study, I think we might have a lot better of idea of, of what's going on there. All right. Yeah, and one of the things that's going on as well is that parents, unfortunately, are giving kids digital devices in bassinets, in cribs. You know, before kids are learning to speak now, they are able to operate digital devices, open apps, open a game, watch a video on YouTube. Some of our infants have better digital skills than our senior citizens, and they don't have the ability to speak yet. That's going to rewire their brains. They're building different neural pathways. And as I've gone on speaking tours with my book, I've had people run up to me and say, we're seeing speech delays in kids because they're being spoken to less face to face. So there's always that mediated, they're looking at and passively taking in uh, entertainment on a device as opposed to being spoken to directly and seeing the mouth and the face of a parent or caretaker and they're, they're resulting in speech delays and other developmental delays. So once again, as Ian mentioned, we don't know the full story yet, but there's some hints out there, again, that we don't want to go too far onto all day digital. I'd like to talk a little bit about the social media platforms themselves and, and what you think their responsibility, their ethical responsibility might be in this situation. And you know, is it, is it even possible for them to balance their desire for user engagement with you know, some sort of responsibility for their users' well-being? Um, so I, I can start here. Um, my research suggests that you can balance the two. Um, in fact, one of our uh, one of my papers that uh, came out last year studied why um, people reshare misinformation um, and found that a lot of people do it not only knowingly um, <laughs> but also relatively mindlessly and automatically um, and social media platforms, um, one thing we did to try to fix this was actually reward people instead of uh, for the things that they thought would get them the most attention, um, reward them for the things that were accurate, factually true, uh, for sharing those things instead. And when we kind of closed people off and tested this in a closed environment, um, we found that you can actually increase the amount of accurate and truthful content that is shared on your platform without completely tanking engagement. Um, it's just uh, that the current design um, brings a mix of both true and false sharing and almost sometimes rewards people for sharing misinformation because it's more controversial, right? Um, and trying to change that is very tough. It's a tough sell because you have to show social platforms that their main uh, revenue driver, which is time spent on the website, isn't also going to tank when you change these systems, right? But I do think that they have um, an ethical and moral responsibility to you know, understand that their websites are causing a lot of well-documented problems. Um, and my research was only on people in the United States uh, we know that the issues with misinformation uh, on Facebook's own platform, as well as on WhatsApp, have resulted in um, massacres in certain places based on false information, um, uh, places outside the U.S., and that's because Facebook spends about 80% of its budget uh, monitoring content in the U.S. and about 20% based on its on the rest of the world, which is actually about the reverse of that is how the user base is distributed. So 80% of Facebook's user base gets 20% of their work on monitoring the type of content that people are being exposed to. Um, and America, which, so 
that is to say that we're getting the best version of Facebook and the best version of Instagram, and we still are having quite a few problems. So I think the moral and ethical responsibility to not only help people with well-being, but also to prevent these other types of issues um, is, is, is really on the shoulders of these platforms, and it's high time that they've done something about it, I think. So yeah, if there is yeah. something, oh, go ahead, Julie. Oh, I was just going to say that, you know, I don't think that Facebook or any of these platforms set off to cause a mental health crisis in our country amongst youth or uh, set out to erode democracy. I, I don't think any of that was the intention at all in any way. However, there are unintended consequences to all technologies. You know, you think about a car getting in an accident starting out, they didn't have seat belts, right? And now we realize that, oh, maybe we need something to keep us in the car if there's an accident. Let's have seat belts be part of the story. And and now that's just a generally taken for granted. Nobody even thinks about a seat belt. That's just part of what you do. You get in and put on your seat belt when you're driving your car. So I think that we're at that stage of social media development. Again, we came running out of the box like horses in a horse race, excited you know, with these new platforms and new possibilities. And now time to step back as they mature and say to ourselves, okay, is this what we want? Is this the direction that we want? Do we need to recalibrate what we're doing? And combined with what Ian was saying, uh, one of the things I was concerned about is knowing about social psychology as both of us do, uh, there's a lot of false information that's being spread by bots and false persons uh, out there that the platforms can identify and could get rid of, but that it boosts their user base, right? Then the advertisers see more people that they could potentially reach. So I think that's where the ethical concern might come in is to think about that um, as both the eroding democracy problem and the stressing people out, upsetting people, causing negative emotions side of the coin um, is to cull back uh, these bots that are oftentimes from other states, uh, bad actors that are trying to divide and conquer in a very subtle way. It's like a cyber war going on here. Uh, that we're party to. And as people that are well-versed in social psychology, which means pushing groups of people in certain directions, uh, these, these precepts are very well-known, very well-researched, and now they're being uh, put at scale using uh, social media and bots and, you know, fake persons in a sense. So this is going to be the, the issue of the day for our uh, <laughs> for our coming election. Uh, Julie, you sort of hinted at this, but I, I kind of want to ask it, the question directly. Is, is this something that you think policymakers should be getting involved in? I mean, do we need laws that uh, you know force the social media platforms to implement the kinds of, um, the, the kinds of algorithms that, that Ian was suggesting? Well, I think that we are entering now into the next phase of development of our digital world. And that is we're entering into the AI revolution. And uh, I think that we were, we're going to need uh, some marker of provenance to be able to discern uh, fake from real. I think that's gonna be one of the most challenging uh, issues that we face uh, as, as people living in a digital world is we will no longer be able to discern what's real and what's not, and sharing that fake information because it will be generated um, by AI's videos. You know, it used to be, hey, I saw it with my own eyes. You know, no, no, I saw it happen. I saw it with my own eyes. Well, there's technology now that can fool those eyes, that can fool you to think you saw something that never happened. So I think in terms of policy, we know that lawmakers lag far behind in understanding these technologies. If you want an example of that, look at the Zuckerberg hearings. And they said, how is it that Facebook is free? And he blinked and sat there a moment and said, we run ads, you know, sir, we run ads because, oh, okay. You know, they don't even understand the basics of it, much less these more nuanced issues that are going to be driving our, our country going forward. Yeah. 
Oh, sorry, I didn't hear you, Jonas. Um, so, yeah, I, I completely agree, Julie. Um, the I, I think a lot of what has happened so far with attempts to um, have legislative action within the U.S. have shown that there's both a lack of understanding um, and a lack of viability for some of the uh, attempts that are currently being made. Although I, I have some hope that some more recent attempts seem to be gaining a little bit of steam, uh, but we'll see. Uh, <laughs> and the, um, however, I think the EU um, has shown already that um, some uh, some things can be done, right? So they've started to do things around data policy. Um, actually, uh, California itself has been considering um, mandating uh, chrono reverse chronological um, news feeds uh, rather than um, ones that are completely based on the posts that get the most attention, as I was talking about before. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I think that policymakers do have a role to play here, um, but I think it's important that they really understand, as you said, the nuances of what they're legislating because um, that will then determine sort of the effectiveness of um, the laws that they make because the the platforms are um, very smart about the ways that they design themselves and would all, and I assume will also be very smart about the ways they um, handle uh, potential regulations as well. So. Okay, I am going to start uh, dipping into some of the excellent questions that our audience has been asking. And the first one is from Sidant, and he asks, do you have any suggestions on the right time to check social media? I think this is a really good question. The lockbox acts can allow you to set specific durations of allowance. What would the right duration be? Do we need to uh, put that thing in the lockbox for one hour, for two hours, and when? It's mornings or evenings, does it doesn't matter. Any advice? Well, I would just say, uh, again, based on the sleeplessness around the world, our global sleep deprivation issue we have going on, you know, some simple things. One is, you know, charge that phone outside of your bedroom or outside of, you know, the side of your bed where it's subconsciously it's always right there. You're going to check it in the middle of the night. Uh, so that's one of the things I would think about. Also, having a wind down period. Your brain is so stimulated by that blue light of your phone uh, that, you know, you're looking at the phone right up into bed and then you're laying there for hours. You know, you don't know why you're so wound up. So starting that process, you know, at least an hour before bedtime to do a wind down time where you don't have a device and immediately get into bed, I think is helpful. Yeah, I, I definitely agree about the before bed thing. Um, that as well as uh, like first thing when you wake up, if you're sitting in bed, it's also can be pretty stressful to suddenly just get a flood of notifications. So allow yourself a little warm up uh, into the day, maybe check it after you've had your coffee rather than before, um, <laughs> these kind of things. Uh, and also I think uh, to riff off of what um, Julie was saying earlier, um, try not to check it when you're out socializing with friends in the real world um, or when you're supposed to be doing other things uh, in person. Um, but uh, I think other times when, you know, you're by yourself and you're not winding down or warming up for the day, sure, why not? So there's a, another a related question from one of our audience members who says, how do we encourage digital breaks among friends? I can hardly have a dinner with most friends without their phones being on the table or checked constantly. Do you have, have any advice for how to, how to interact with this situation socially? That's so true. I had lunch with a friend of mine and he was, he likes to talk a lot and, you know, he's talking and talking and then it was my turn to say something and he would immediately pick up the phone and scrolling. And then when he was talking again, he was talking to me. And then when I talked, he would pick up the phone literally every time. And I did not feel heard in that. It's like, do, do you want to hear this or not? You know, it gives you a bad feeling. And so I totally relate to what this person's saying here. And what I would say is set the expectations ahead of time. I remember we had a Thanksgiving once, we had a basket and it's like, okay, everybody, you know, put your phone in the basket ahead of time. And then we took them away. So setting the expectation ahead of time 
hey guys, let's get together and reconnect and and let's uh, make sure our phones are all in our bags or in our pockets and, and not be checking them during the lunch. Set the expectation before you get there, uh, I think will help uh, to deal with that because it literally is that addictive quality and you want another hit of that dopamine uh, at the table. So it's very challenging, but if you all agree and that's what you're going to do, let's just set it aside for the next hour and a half and have lunch together and reconnect. I think it'll be easier than trying to get, hey, don't use that phone you know, when you're already at the table. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's a really good strategy, especially encouraging like advanced communication among the friend group and all being on board, like, you know, hey, we're gonna put our phones away for this. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna interact and engage with each other face to face. You know, if if someone does have something to show somebody else, like a photo or something, maybe you can take the phone out, but probably try to put it back away as soon as you can after <laughs> after that interaction, right? Yeah, then you're checking messages and then those alerts are coming in. It's that task. Exactly. Week. Next thing you know, yeah. you're checking your email. It's like, no, no. <laughs> yeah. Got to be very careful. Um, here's, a, here's a question that has resonated with me as, as a parent. I, I think a lot of us struggle with this question. Do you, have, do you have any advice for parents in monitoring their children's online activity from elementary to high school? How do we deal with this as parents? Well, that's very challenging. Uh, you know, even recently there are, you know, children's programming, for example, on YouTube, you know, you might see some Peppa Pig videos or things like that. And parents can, as I mentioned earlier, hand their kid a device and think they're watching Peppa Pig. But in reality, the Peppa Pig videos, and I'm just giving this as one example, have been hijacked and people are creating this frightening, horrifying content that the kids are watching that's like it's not peppa pig at all it's disguised as that and there's all these untoward things going on so you know understanding what your kid is watching but again also limiting that time and also for the parent i mean imagine we just talked about the friend groups and friends not feeling heard or friends not feeling connected to one another imagine if you're a kid and you're you want attention from your parent and they're on their phone scrolling for hours. You know, you're sitting there and you need that, uh, you know, to feel good about yourself, to develop your sense of identity. Uh, Cooley calls us the looking glass self. We develop our sense of self through our interactions with others. And if that looking glass self, your parents looking at a phone, what un unconscious message are you sending to your child? You know, well, you're not any big deal. You're not important, you know, and they're internalizing these messages. So just remember, it goes both sides. It's what the kids are doing, but it's also what the parents are doing and the attention or lack thereof in that relationship between parent and child. We have to be mindful of that as well. Yeah, I think absolutely um, kind of embodying that sort of mindful relationship with technology that you want your child to have is incredibly important because um, kids are super sensitive to um, the role models and what the people around them do, right? Um, I think also, you know, especially as uh, kids get into high school age, um, you don't want to uh, necessarily make them feel like they need to be hiding what they're doing online because that can only exacerbate issues, right? You want to have honest conversations with them about the things that they're looking at, um, even getting their thoughts about the things that they're seeing. Um, trying to understand and make sure that they are um, kind of seeing it uh, in a holistic way and not consuming content or going down all the strange possible rabbit holes that the internet can offer, right? Um, so you want to really make sure that um, your kids understand that the internet is a place with a lot of great things and a lot of really horrible things as well. <laughs> um, and that both, all of those things are there and uh, how to understand them and how to deal with them when they see things that they are confused by or don't understand or these kind of things. You want to keep that conversation open always, I think, and also um, alongside embodying that um, mindful behavior that we talked about before. That uh, that Peppa Pig example is, is terrifying. 
Um, it is, yeah. I, I'd, like to, <laughs> I'd like to talk yeah. about uh, misinformation on the internet in general a little bit more. Um, Ian, you mentioned uh, a study that you had done, and we have a, a question from one of our audience members who asks, how do we test and trust the information that we see on social media, and how do we not feel overwhelmed by all the news? Yeah, I think it's really important to develop your own and uh, to call back the other question also for your kids, their information literacy, right? So understanding, you know, what the source of the information is, who is saying this, what are their motivations for saying this? Is this video something that is uh, you know, real, right? Because uh, is it from where the where the post says it's from, um, right? Because, for example, the other day there were a ton of AI generated videos floating around of Taylor Swift, um, so many that Twitter had to basically block searches for Taylor Swift's name uh, on the site, and these kind of things happen to celebrities, um, but it's also going to start happening more and more broadly and more often. Um, and also there'll be footage that's taken completely out of context, right? Totally decontextualized of things and put in a new context in a post, right? So using reverse image search uh, with Google, trying to figure out exactly where the source came from, uh, the source of the information is coming from. And if you can't figure out what that source is and whether or not that source is trustworthy, then you don't know whether that's not or true, right? And I think it's also good to encourage people that to say, you know, this isn't full, like this isn't 100% true or 100% false, right? It's also okay to say, I don't know if this is 100% true or like this is true, but uh, you know, X, Y, and Z, and this is the context that I can couch it in, right? So I think it's very important to do this, but also to understand that, you know, when you are scrolling <laughs> through tons and tons of content, you might not like have the thought or have the time to go deep and search uh, for those kind of things. And in addition, there's a lot of good research on misinformation showing that even just being exposed to this kind of stuff impacts all your future judgments about the topic ever so subtly. Um, so I think a lot of it is gonna be on the platforms themselves to try to be proactive about this kind of stuff. But for users, um, I think trying to increase our information literacy as much as possible is gonna be really crucial, especially because um, I think uh, we've already seen the ways in which AI and um, working together with bot farms, which kind of have already existed, can supercharge um, the problem of misinformation. So I think it's, it's a time to be very cautious about um, things that we see online. Julie, anything to add about misinformation? Well, I just remember one of my favorite writers, Ray Bradbury, which some of our audience may know who's a science fiction writer. And he used to say uh, about the news, you know, your questioner asked about, you know, how do we not feel overwhelmed by all the news, all the bad news is what you're saying. We're not overwhelmed by good news, right? And he used to say, if you feel bad, turn off your television. And, you know, he's kind of like, you know, presaging where we're at now. Turn off your social media, you know, and get walk away from it. Go for a walk, see some friends, be with your family, go to the gym, you know, do some alternative behavior uh, as opposed to getting in, as Ian mentioned, those rabbit holes, just getting sucked into bad news because, you know, it's bad for your spirit in the long run. We need a balancing point as opposed to getting drowned by bad news. So find positive habits to counteract the bad news out there, physical, physicality, do yoga, do exercise, be with friends, be with loved ones, you know, read positive things. And it's not just being a Pollyanna, it's you need to reinforce yourself against the onslaught of bad news that's coming at us every day. There's a, uh, a very sort of specific question from, from Berkeley who, who asks, um, they say that they coach students with ADHD. 
and are wondering uh, if, if being on the phone is exacerbating their ADHD. Do, do either of you know of any specific research about ADHD with social media use? Yeah, I'm sure Ian's going to speak okay. to that, but I, I would just say that there are, that's part of the, as we got into a little bit earlier, you know, ongoing, let's see what happens with kids that are on phones almost constantly. And the point of stimulation and needing constant stimulation and, you know, things, it's going to create an environment where complex problems require thought and time and in-depth focus. And all of this that we're talking about is the antithesis to that. So it, it's it's kind of like, you know, how can you be with yourself? I'm bored, you know, that issue with the ADHD. I need I need a level of stimulation, you know, and, and I think your brain gets used to that level of constant stimulation. That's why I'm suggesting a rebalancing with tech and with our analog lives so that, you know, you give your brain a rest. We're overstimulated. We're exhausting ourselves in this environment. So... I think that's an important factor, especially for kids. Right, and I, I think it is very much kind of this omnipresence of the smartphones and computers as well, right? Um, you are constantly feeling pulled in all of these different directions. There's a lot of attention grabbing things on both of those things, in both of those places. Um, I haven't seen as much research on whether or not specifically it exacerbates um, ADHD symptoms, right? But I do know that um, in general, people with um, neurological uh, disorders or who are not neurotypical can have greater struggles um, controlling their social media use, right? Um, because you know, and there are all sorts of theories that I could really dig into about why that is. But I think uh, the best thing that you can try to do is to make sure that, you know, it's not a source of constant distraction. And that is really difficult. You have to be very careful about how you use your phone. Um, and I think especially with uh, young people and students who have these kind of, um, have these issues, um, it's even tougher, right, uh, for them. So I think being mindful of that and also um, trying to offer them strategies to help uh, combat that um, that constant um, attention and time suck that is the mobile phone and also the computer to a degree, right? I think I'd like to add something here, which is uh, aside from being a digital sociologist, I also have a master's and a PhD in counseling. And that's kind of what heightened my interest in some of this in the beginning, putting on my counseling hat. And I, and I see a lot of the questions are concerning uh, kids and teens they're sort of over attach hyper attachment, as I call it, to uh, social media and to their devices. One thing we know about, let's say, addiction or connection to these things, you know, whether it's smoking, whether it, somebody mentioned the connection to big tobacco, you can't just stop doing something. And this is an important point to make. You can't just stop doing something. You have to do something else. So don't just say to your kid, oh, stop using your phone, and th that's it. You have to find a different behavior that is also rewarding, interesting, engaging, et cetera, to take the place of the negative behavior you're trying to stop doing. Don't just stop smoking, chew the gum, right? So what, what's the gum in our situation? Something that is delightful, something interesting, hey, let's all go for a walk, or hey, let's play a game, or let's do whatever X, Y, Z. But it has to take the place of, you can't simply stop doing a behavior. You must replace it with a different behavior that's more positive, that's more helpful, you know, and things like that. So think about yeah. that, parents. What can you replace the behavior with, not just cut off a behavior? That's not going to work. Absolutely. Um, and that's actually a 
trouble that a lot of the scientific study has run into where they've tried to get people to, you know, detox on social media by, you know, using, uh, but like saying, okay, you just stop using social media. And then during the study period, people start using a different app. Right. <laughs> or they or they spend just as much time on a different like a gaming app or something like that. And then yes. you don't see the positive effects of the detox because they spend all their time gaming instead of on social media. Um, so actually, one of the successful studies had interestingly, they actually supplanted it with another app. Right. So they actually got people to like when they felt the need to um, use social media, they had them go on Duolingo, uh, which is a language learning app. And oh, that yeah. actually that actually helped uh, some people control their social media habits a little bit. Um, but also, I think other activities that are not involving the phone. This is an adult study, right? Um, so, in particular, with kids and and also for for adults, I think who feel like they're spending too much on time on the phone in general, um, not just social media. Um, so, planning that activity with a new one that's also rewarding is going to be a really good way to help controlling exactly as as we said. What do you guys uh, feel about uh, minimum age limits for for social media? Should there be a, uh, a a a minimum age for people to use social media, and, and what should that age be? Twelve, sixteen. Well, as I mentioned before, if you go on YouTube and search "baby with iPad," you last time I did it, I got over sixty thousand hits. People are filming their little baby again that can't speak yet using these devices, opening apps, running things. It's unbelievable. Uh, so the Surgeon General has come out and said, I, I, and again, they're still, we're still feeling our way around this new world. This is a brave new world, and we don't have all the answers yet. We're learning, but we're also seeing some of the unintended consequences and trying to figure out how to deal with them. So the Surgeon General is suggesting at least like two, I think it is, it might have been even older now, to not give a device to a little baby like that because of some of the impacts on their development. Uh, and our, um, one of our audience members is suggesting maybe minimum age of 16. Ostensibly, that's what it is, but we know that younger kids are making these accounts. You know, maybe hearing some of these unintended consequences, unintended negative impacts on teens, particularly girls and body image issues, Maybe it's, it's, you know, sitting down with your teen and saying, hey, I know this is everyone's on there and this and that, but, you know, I don't want you to be, you know, and, and explaining what the, what the reasoning is for a little bit older age and holding out. And don't be afraid to be a parent here because, uh, you know, this can be very detrimental to particularly teens as we're seeing. Yeah, and I, I think it's very, it's tough to say precisely what age would would be recommended because the research just isn't quite there yet right we i don't know that we know very well um but at the same time like it's the sites have always had policies around this right so <laughs> they ask you you know how old are you and then as a teenager you know i i did grow up with social media sites and then you lie about your age and then you're on the site when you're young yeah, right yeah. Uh, <laughs> and and that is basically all there is so there's no you know there's absolutely no verification right now um for these kind of things and i know that also um this was an interesting thing that i i think they may have walked this back but i know that instagram had actually tried to release like a version of instagram for younger people that was like um kind of a safer sandbox uh smaller version of the wider site um but yeah, I think it's, there are a number of ways to potentially kind of control and help young people try to have healthier relationships with social media, but it is, it's very tough to pick when somebody is ready to be online. Um, and in a lot of ways, you know, being surrounded by friends who are probably already going to be getting on it makes it even tougher, right? So saying, you know, it's harder to tell your kid no when their entire class is on it and then they feel like a social outclass, outcast because um, they can't be on there, right? So I think it's it's tough to say that there should be like a legally enforceable age, not only because of practical concerns and logistical ones about 
um, people lying about their age because they've tried, <laughs> they've tried to do that. Um, you know, we'd have to probably require people to upload IDs, and then there's all sorts of fun privacy concerns uh, wrapped into that too. Um, so yeah, it's it's a, that's a really tough question, and and I don't know that I have a great answer for a specific age. Yeah. So we have just a few minutes left, and what I'd like to do is just give each of you a chance to say some final words. Um, if there's anything you haven't said yet, if nothing comes to mind, uh, I'm curious what you think about the the future of social media and where all of this is is going. Is it going to get better or worse? But um, let's start with Julie. Julie, concluding thoughts. Gosh, there's so much to be said. We could have this conversation all day. And thank you for such an engaging conversation. I hope this is helpful to. Um, the parents and just to all of us out there, we're, we're navigating a, a new world and, you know, be mindful. I think that's really the key of your use of technology. Try to be more mindful and not be online 24 hours a day and pull your eyeballs away and spend that time out in nature, spend that time with each other, spend that time in physical activities. These are all, as I said, you can't, just stop doing something you have to replace. And all these things that I'm mentioning are healthful, health supporting things that have been done away with as we're spending more and more hours on our phone. So we need to bring them back in to the picture and eat healthy and, and be physical, be with each other and be with nature. And I think those things will help you to lead a, a healthier, happier life. Ian? Yeah, I would absolutely second that and also say to people that it's important not to get too frustrated with yourself or with your kids or friends for um, having really strong uh, social media habits, right? Um, these apps are designed to build those in the first place. Um, so people struggling to be mindful um, is not necessarily their own fault in in many in many cases. So I think it's it's good to remind everyone of that, um, and also to uh, remember that there are ways to handle these things and to be mindful about them. Um, things that we've reviewed here, I think, uh, throughout the conversation, have spoken to that. Um, and so these are things that you can do yourself to take back some control um, while we await either regulation or some changes from the social media companies themselves that uh, might also help us help ourselves, right? That may be a long way. Yeah, I think yeah. <laughs> might be a long way. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> well, I, I, I want to thank both of you, uh, Ian and, and Julie, for, for lending us your expertise on this topic that um, everyone has to struggle with nowadays. And I want to thank the, the audience for, for joining us today. And, um, and that's it. Thank you very much. And I hope everybody takes a break from their phone later on today. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.